Chapter Five, Part Three of Queen Victoria. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Queen Victoria by Giles Lytton Strachey. Chapter Five, Part Three. Three. The Prince's triumph was short-lived. A few weeks later, owing to Palmerston's influence, the government was defeated in the House, and Lord John resigned. Then, after a short interval, a coalition between the Whigs and the followers of Peel came into power, under the premiership of Lord Aberdeen. Once more, Palmerston was in the Cabinet. It was true that he did not return to the Foreign Office. That was something to the good. In the Home Department it might be hoped that his activities would be less dangerous and disagreeable. But the Foreign Secretary was no longer the complacent Granville, and in Lord Clarendon the Prince knew that he had a minister to deal with, who, discreet and courteous as he was, had a mind of his own. These changes, however, were merely the preliminaries of a far more serious development. Events on every side were moving towards a catastrophe. Suddenly the nation found itself under the awful shadow of imminent war. For several months, amid the shifting mysteries of diplomacy and the perplexed agitations of politics, the issue grew more doubtful and more dark, while the national temper was strained to the breaking point. At the very crisis of the long and ominous negotiations, it was announced that Lord Palmerston had resigned. Then the pent-up fury of the people burst forth. They had felt that in the terrible complexity of events they were being guided by weak and embarrassed counsels, but they had been reassured by the knowledge that at the center of power there was one man, with strength, with courage, with determination, in whom they could put their trust. They now learned that that man was no longer among their leaders. Why? In their rage, anxiety, and nervous exhaustion, they looked round desperately for some hidden and horrible explanation of what had occurred. They suspected plots. They smelt treachery in the air. It was easy to guess the object upon which their frenzy would vent itself. Was there not a foreigner in the highest of high places, a foreigner whose hostility to their own adored champion was unrelenting and unconcealed? The moment that Palmerston's resignation was known, there was a universal outcry, and an extraordinary tempest of anger and hatred burst with unparalleled violence upon the head of the prince. It was everywhere asserted and believed that the queen's husband was a traitor to the country, that he was a tool of the Russian court, that in obedience to Russian influences he had forced Palmerston out of the government and that he was directing the foreign policy of England in the interests of England's enemies. For many weeks these accusations filled the whole of the press. Repeated at public meetings, elaborated in private talk, they flew over the country, growing every moment more extreme and more improbable. While respectable newspapers thundered out their grave invectives, halfpenny broadsides hawked through the streets of London re-echoed in doggerel vulgarity, the same sentiments and the same suspicions. Note. The Turkish war both far and near has played the very deuce then, and little Al, the royal pal, they say has turned a Russian. Old Aberdeen, as may be seen, looks woeful pale and yellow, and old John Bull had his belly full of dirty Russian tallow. Chorus. We'll send him home and make him groan, O oh, Al, you've played the deuce then. The German lad has acted sad and turned tail with the Russians. Last Monday night, all in a fright, Al out of bed did tumble. The German lad was raving mad, how he did groan and grumble. He cried to Vic, I've cut my stick to St. Petersburg, go right slap. When Vic, his head, jumped out of bed and whopped him with her nightcap. We'll send him home and make him groan, O oh, Al, you've played the deuce then. The German lad has acted sad and turned tail with the Russians. From Lovely Albert, a broadside preserved at the British Museum. End of note. At last the wildest rumors began to spread. In January 1854 it was whispered that the prince had been seized. 
that he had been found guilty of high treason, that he was to be committed to the tower. The queen herself, some declared, had been arrested, and large crowds actually collected round the tower to watch the incarceration of the royal miscreants. Note. You jolly Turks now go to work and show the bear your power. It is rumoured over Britain's isle that A is in the tower. The postman some suspicion had, and opened the two letters. Twas pity sad the German lad should not have known much better. Lovely Albert. End of note. These fantastic hallucinations, the result of the fevered atmosphere of approaching war, were devoid of any basis in actual fact. Palmerston's resignation had been in all probability totally disconnected with foreign policy. It had certainly been entirely spontaneous, and had surprised the court as much as the nation. Nor had Albert's influence been used in any way to favor the interests of Russia. As often happens in such cases, the government had been swinging backwards and forwards between two incompatible policies, that of non-interference and that of threats supported by force either of which, if consistently followed, might well have had a successful and peaceful issue, but which, mingled together, could only lead to war. Albert, with characteristic scrupulosity, attempted to thread his way through the complicated labyrinth of European diplomacy, and eventually was lost in the maze. But so was the whole of the cabinet, and when war came, his anti-Russian feelings were quite as vehement as those of the most bellicose of Englishmen. Nevertheless, though the specific charges leveled against the prince were without foundation, there were underlying elements in the situation which explained, if they did not justify, the popular state of mind. It was true that the queen's husband was a foreigner, who had been brought up in a foreign court, was impregnated with foreign ideas, and was closely related to a multitude of foreign princes. Clearly this, though perhaps an unavoidable, was an undesirable state of affairs. Nor were the objections to it merely theoretical. It had, in fact, produced unpleasant consequences of a serious kind. The prince's German proclivities were perpetually lamented by English ministers. Lord Palmerston, Lord Clarendon, Lord Aberdeen, all told the same tale, and it was constantly necessary, in grave questions of national policy, to combat the prepossessions of a court in which German views and German sentiments held a disproportionate place. As for Palmerston, his language on this topic was apt to be unbridled. At the height of his annoyance over his resignation, he roundly declared that he had been made a victim to foreign intrigue. He afterwards toned down this accusation, but the mere fact that such a suggestion from such a quarter was possible at all showed to what unfortunate consequences Albert's foreign birth and foreign upbringing might lead. But this was not all. A constitutional question of the most profound importance was raised by the position of the prince in England. His presence gave a new prominence to an old problem, the precise definition of the functions and the powers of the crown. Those functions and powers had become, in effect, his. And what sort of use was he making of them? His views as to the place of the crown in the Constitution are easily ascertainable, for they were Stockmar's, and it happens that we possess a detailed account of Stockmar's opinions upon the subject in a long letter addressed by him to the Prince at the time of this very crisis, just before the outbreak of the Crimean War constitutional monarchy, according to the baron, had suffered an eclipse since the passing of the reform bill. It was now constantly in danger of becoming a pure ministerial government. The old race of Tories, who had a direct interest in upholding the prerogatives of the crown, had died out, and the Whigs were nothing but partly conscious, partly unconscious Republicans, who stand in the same relation to the throne as the wolf does to the lamb. There was a rule that it was unconstitutional to introduce the name and person of the irresponsible sovereign into parliamentary debates on constitutional matters. This was a constitutional fiction which, although undoubtedly of old standing, was fraught with danger. And the baron warned the prince that, 
if the english crown permit a whig ministry to follow this rule in practice without exception you must not wonder if in a little time you find the majority of the people impressed with the belief that the king in the view of the law is nothing but a mandarin figure which has to nod its head in assent or shake it in denial as his minister pleases to prevent this from happening it was of extreme importance said the baron that no opportunity should be let slip of vindicating the legitimate position of the crown and this is not hard to do he added and can never embarrass a minister where such straightforward and loyal personages as the queen and the prince are concerned in his opinion the very lowest claim of the royal prerogative should include a right on the part of the king to be the permanent president of his ministerial council the sovereign ought to be in the position of a permanent premier who takes rank above the temporary head of the cabinet and in matters of discipline exercises supreme authority the sovereign may even take a part in the initiation and the maturing of the government measures for it would be unreasonable to expect that a king himself as able as accomplished and as patriotic as the best of his ministers should be prevented from making use of these qualities at the deliberations of his council the judicious exercise of this right concluded the baron which certainly requires a master mind would not only be the best guarantee for constitutional monarchy but would raise it to a height of power stability and symmetry which has never been attained now it may be that this reading of the constitution is a possible one though indeed it is hard to see how it can be made compatible with the fundamental doctrine of ministerial responsibility william the third presided over his council and he was a constitutional monarch and it seems that stockmar had in his mind a conception of the crown which would have given it a place in the constitution analogous to that which it filled at the time of william the third but it is clear that such a theory which would invest the crown with more power than it possessed even under george the third runs counter to the whole development of english public life since the revolution and the fact that it was held by stockmar and instilled by him into albert was of very serious importance for there was good reason to believe not only that these doctrines were held by albert in theory but that he was making a deliberate and sustained attempt to give them practical validity. The history of the struggle between the Crown and Palmerston provided startling evidence that this was the case. That struggle reached its culmination when, in Stockmar's Memorandum of 1850, the Queen asserted her constitutional right to dismiss the Foreign Secretary if he altered a dispatch which had received her sanction. The memorandum was, in fact, a plain declaration that the Crown intended to act independently of the Prime Minister. Lord John Russell, anxious at all costs to strengthen himself against Palmerston, accepted the memorandum and thereby implicitly allowed the claim of the Crown. More than that, after the dismissal of Palmerston, among the grounds on which Lord John justified that dismissal in the House of Commons, he gave a prominent place to the Memorandum of 1850. It became apparent that the displeasure of the sovereign might be a reason for the removal of a powerful and popular minister. It seemed indeed as if, under the guidance of Stockmar and Albert, the constitutional monarchy might in very truth be rising to a height of power, stability, and symmetry which had never been attained. But this new development in the position of the crown, grave as it was in itself, was rendered peculiarly disquieting by the unusual circumstances which surrounded it. For the functions of the crown were now in effect being exercised by a person unknown to the constitution who wielded over the sovereign an undefined and unbounded influence the fact that this person was the sovereign's husband while it explained his influence and even made it inevitable by no means diminished its strange and momentous import an ambiguous prepotent figure had come to disturb the ancient subtle and jealously guarded balance of the english constitution 
such had been the unexpected outcome of the tentative and faint-hearted opening of albert's political life he himself made no attempt to minimize either the multiplicity or the significance of the functions he performed he considered that it was his duty he told the duke of wellington in eighteen fifty to sink his own individual existence in that of his wife assume no separate responsibility before the public but make his position entirely a part of hers fill up every gap which as a woman she would naturally leave in the exercise of her regal functions continually and anxiously watch every part of the public business in order to be able to advise and assist her at any moment in any of the multifarious and difficult questions or duties brought before her sometimes international sometimes political or social or personal as the natural head of her family superintendent of her household manager of her private affairs sole confidential adviser in politics and only assistant in her communication with the offices of the government he is besides the husband of the queen the tutor of the royal children the private secretary of the sovereign and her permanent minister stockmar's pupil had assuredly gone far and learnt well stockmar's pupil precisely the public painfully aware of albert's predominance had grown too uneasily conscious that victoria's master had a master of his own deep in the darkness the baron loomed another foreigner decidedly there were elements in the situation which went far to justify the popular alarm a foreign baron controlled a foreign prince and the foreign prince controlled the crown of england and the crown itself was creeping forward ominously and when from under its shadow the baron and the prince had frowned a great minister beloved of the people had fallen where was all this to end within a few weeks palmerston withdrew his resignation and the public frenzy subsided as quickly as it had arisen when parliament met the leaders of both the parties in both the houses made speeches in favor of the prince asserting his unimpeachable loyalty to the country and vindicating his right to advise the sovereign in all matters of state victoria was delighted the position of my beloved lord and master she told the baron has been defined for once amid all and his merits have been acknowledged on all sides most duly there was an immense concourse of people assembled when we went to the house of lords and the people were very friendly immediately afterwards the country finally plunged into the crimean war in the struggle that followed albert's patriotism was put beyond a doubt and the animosities of the past were forgotten but the war had another consequence less gratifying to the royal couple it crowned the ambition of lord palmerston in eighteen fifty five the man who five years before had been pronounced by lord john russell to be too old to do much in the future became prime minister of england and with one short interval remained in that position for ten years end of chapter five part three